So I'm just so happy to welcome today and to be in conversation with Rabbi Danny Weiner, who's the senior rabbi at Temple to Her Sinai in Seattle, uh, the temple where Rabbi Raphael Levine, one of the founders of Paths to Understanding, uh, served for many years. Um, Danny, thank you so much for being in conversation with me about the whole idea of sacrifice. And we've got a number of questions here, and I just appreciate your time today. It's my honor and pleasure. It, uh, I feel so blessed to be uh, the successor to Rabbi Levine and Father Tracy's work and the work that you are so critically facilitating moving forward. So please, it's a joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. So, you know, today there are so many people who are kind of setting aside traditions, sort of blaming traditions and and communities of wisdom in general for all of our problems. Why why is a tradition important? You know, I think a tradition is important because it is uh, profoundly grounding. As, as much as I am a supporter of the freedoms of our liberal democracy, at times they can be a little bit fo too focused on the individual. And this notion of a tradition that connects you to ideas and people in places, both in time and in space, is, is really critical. I think what it is to live a healthy, ethical, moral life, spiritually, psychologically, et cetera, is really to find that balance between the traditions, the, the, the gifts of wisdom and insight that we have inherited from those who came before us with a, a need to respond to modern sensibilities and, and modern needs. And so I think tradition is, is like everything in life, moderation and finding that middle ground is really important. Too much individualism and we're all disconnected. Too much tradition and there is not a responsiveness to the changing sensibilities of our contemporary times. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Danny, in the last, especially 40 years, but maybe just a bit longer, Christians have begun to reckon with the reality that by the end of the first century, that many Christian teachers and writers were no longer Jewish and had really lost touch with the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the culture of first century Israel, a culture in which Jesus was living and leading and, uh, and having conversations. So um, part of the conversation today is to ask, what are the ancient origins of sacrificing an animal to God as far as we can know it today? So probably one of the most primitive kind of pre-Jewish notions or pre-Israelite, excuse me, that's a better way of describing it, pre-Israelite notions from the ancient Near East was really kind of um, feeding and assuaging the god or the gods. Um, you know, you had a great hunt, uh, that was not something that you took for granted, and so you would make an offering of part of your, your bounty to the gods or god or whomever as a way of um, you know, thanking nature for, for having provided something that, you know, they didn't really take for granted. Judaism, the early Israelite religion, really uh, built upon that, but took it in a very different direction. And the main direction um, had to do with our understanding of what those sacrifices, what those offerings meant to God. From a Jewish perspective, the God, God does not need our sacrifices. The sacrifices are far more about the transformation that takes place within the person who is giving the sacrifice, both the individual transformation, personal transformation, but also the transformation of a larger society that takes place through that giving beyond oneself, thinking and being aware of the needs of those beyond oneself. And from our, you know, from our theological understanding in Judaism, God doesn't need animals. God doesn't need sacrifices. God is certainly transcends need, let alone the need for things. The, why God requests this, why God commands this from an, from an ancient Israelite point of view is to render a, transform, a, a profound transformation and broadening of scope for us. Yeah, that's really wonderful to hear. And I, I, I first came across this idea when I was in seminary, you know, um, through the writing of a biblical scholar named Lawrence Boat, you know, who wrote, this was just in my seminary introduction to introduction to the Hebrew scripture class, you know, that the Hebrew people, unlike uh, many of those around, around them at the time, did not really think that set their sacrifices changed God, which, which seems kind of arrogant that we could like do something that would change God's you know, heart or character toward us, right? But, you know, sadly, um, I think what, what, what has happened, uh, it's largely through the, the writing of one guy named Anselm of Canterbury, 
who in the 11th century was almost completely unaware of the Hebrew tradition around sacrifice, and he was a feudal lord. And so as a feudal lord, anybody born on his property basically belonged, you know, to him. And so he kind of used that as a metaphor uh, for, um, for Christianity and basically saying that, you know, we owe the creator obedience, um, but you can't be extra, extra obedient. You're either obedient or you're not. And so if you sin against your Lord, well, then there's no possible forgiveness for it because then the whole feudal system would break down. And so it requires some kind of payment or some kind of punishment. And then the idea that Jesus provides that payment, you know, through through the cross and and so on. And, and so many Christians really struggle with this. So um, again, like you, what you're saying is that in the Hebrew tradition, it was kind of distinct from other some other traditions saying that 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 God doesn't really need sacrifice. I mean, that's that's really different for, for many Christians to contemplate. No, absolutely. In, in terms of what you're saying about Anselm, I'm reminded of that old Mark Twain phrase that man created, excuse me, God created man and man returned the favor. In other words, it's not surprising that Anselm, just from his kind of narrow scope of how the world worked for him, you know, felt that that would be a model or a template to apply to the cosmos and the, and the universe. You know, the Hebrew word for sacrifice or for an offer, offering is korban. And korban comes from the Hebrew root meaning to draw near, to bring closer. And so inherent in that sense that yes, it is a, in some ways in the immediate, in the immediate moment, a one way offering. It really is about bringing the worshiper closer to God. And even more importantly, bringing the worshiper closer to other people in the community. Because logistically speaking, the sacrifices, and I'm overgeneralizing, but it's basically this, were divided into three parts. One part would go to the poor in the community. One part would go to the priestly class and their families because their full-time gig was running the temple. They weren't out raising animals or, or farming. And then a part of it was, was burned on an altar to God. Um, but you know, it's that part that was burned onto an altar to God, which really, I think in many ways, symbolically and motivationally undergirded the first two. That is supporting the sacrificial system, but most importantly, um, raise, heightening awareness and, and, and motivating offerings to, to those in need within the community. Right. You know, so, you know, so in the Hebrew scripture, you know, there's a number of, of passages. Some of them seem to suggest that sacrificing is, is absolutely essential in some way. And there's other ones that are kind of a critique of that idea. So in Exodus 20, you need make for me only an altar of earth and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your offerings of well-being, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. And that's an example of kind of the necessity or the importance of sacrifice, perhaps. And then there's many others, including uh, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 6, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So can you kind of help us understand, like from, from the broad Jewish perspective, um, these two seemingly disparate statements? No, absolutely. So um, looking at it from the point of view of the biblical period, the prophetic critique of the sacrificial system once it was established, the prophets were basically saying, um, the prophets were recognizing that people were missing the forest for the trees. They were getting so bogged down in a punctilious fidelity to the details of the sacrifices that they lost the, the train of thought to truly understand and appreciate that the sacrifices were a means to an end, not an end in and of themselves. The point of the sacrifices was to get to the values and ethics behind the sacrifices. And today, my branch of Judaism has taken that kind of to the next level and said, we resonate with the prophetic message because today people get so hung up on ritual that they forget that the ritual is a means to an end to the values and ethics and morality that lies beneath. So the prophetic critique was really saying, look, don't feel like your, your, your entire uh, duties to God, your worship of God has been discharged because you've gone through the motions. Unless your heart uh, and your actions based on that changed heart align with the point of what those sacrifices are supposed to intend, you're, you're not only missing the point, but it's like an ultimate um, insult to God and to the community because your, your intention is just to check off things on a laundry list 
not to actually change one's heart, one's mind, and one's actions. In terms of the Exodus text, one of the things that's really critical to understand about Jewish history and what makes that intertestamental period, that period between the closing out of the, of the Jewish scriptures and the, the New Testament, is that that was a, a, a dramatic and transformative uh, period. Not only in terms of Jesus and the advent of Christianity, but also the destruction of the temple in 70 CE by the Romans, the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem, was a, uh, meant to be, and it was, a catastrophic event. And the Romans, you know, did, and other imperial forces did these kinds of things to destroy a national, cultural, and religious and political center as a way of undermining that whole society and absorbing them into the greater empire. Now, that should have happened to the Jewish people. However, they uh, were able to do something pretty significant. They were able to maintain a connection to the transcendent values of Judaism while changing significantly and dramatically the way Judaism was practiced. So in other words, instead of a central temple, suddenly you had local synagogues throughout the community. Instead of a sacrificial system that was based on animal sacrifice and fire and flame and blood, sacrifice became verbal and became the, the, the work, the worship of the heart, not the worship of, of the material offerings. Uh, and instead of priests being the main authoritative body based on their understanding of the sacrificial system, you had rabbis who based their understanding on the interpretation of scripture. And so Judaism did something incredibly clever, and it's really the only reason why it survived, is that it was able to radically change, modify, and adapt to the changing circumstances of a life without the temple, while at the same time staying connected to the profound values that undergirded Judaism from its earliest stages. Right, so the point of sacrifice was really to offer something of value, in this case, our heart, our intentions, our prayers, our time to be in community, our, our ability to love our neighbor around us and take care of those who are hurting in this moment or maybe are poor in this moment, um, but, to, but, to, but to do the act of sacrificing that to the creator, um, sort of partly in, gr in gratitude, for the gift of life that we're all experiencing here together. Yeah, the psycho-spiritual, you know, kind of bottom line here is if you can make room in your consciousness for God and things bigger than yourself and certainly something as august as God, how much more so hopefully can you broaden your narrow perspective on the world beyond yourself and your kin and encompass the greater good of the society in which you live? Right, which brings us back, you know, to the first question, really, like, what's a what's a tradition for? You know, it's to lift up some values um, that are that are really important that we're willing to sacrifice for values that we're willing to hold ourselves accountable to uh, stories that help encourage us and to understand how to live those values in the real world in real time. You know, and then over time to be able to look at ourselves and say, well, hey, you know, this is what we said that was important to us and did we do that and to hold ourselves accountable for that which of course is what the prophetic tradition in, in the hebrew scripture is all about is is a community holding itself accountable and i i think to some degree you know christianity is trying to rediscover that prophetic tradition about ourselves like what's what how, how should we hold ourselves accountable to our stated ideals um after so many centuries where the, you know, after the Emperor Constantine essentially took over Christianity, I think, um, we really had not the conversion of the empire, but the conversion of Christianity to support empire. And we're still trying to recover from that and even identify the many ways in which that has impacted our, our prayers, our liturgies, our worship, our songs, our theology, our understanding of the, of the, of the Hebrew scripture, and our understanding of the Christian scriptures. That's uh, I could not have put it better myself, but I would not dare have spoken <laughs> outside of my my bailiwick here. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Danny, thank you so much for taking this time to be in conversation with us and and the folk that are watching this video. And we just so appreciate your leadership and your friendship as well. It's my honor and pleasure, and thank you for all that you do. And look forward to continuing our work together to respond to the needs of of a troubled moment.